in his final years, was the world real to him? Did he really know what was going on? He, he really didn't know what was going on. Uh, Hubbard had finally become so um, taken up in his own world where he couldn't even distinguish between what was real and what wasn't. He lived in a movie set, a Hollywood movie set that he thought was real. He couldn't distinguish between the front and the back. He was sending, you know, issuing, he was issuing materials that we had, you know, difficulty really understanding. Um, he, as I said, he was a, it was a storyteller caught up in his own stories, and he couldn't, he couldn't distinguish it anymore. In that final week, um, what have you been told about his, uh, and, and he, what have you been told about his physical and mental condition at that time? Not so much final, but in those final years at Creston, what was he actually physically and mentally like by then? I wasn't at Creston to, to see him or meet with him uh, when he was alive. But uh, speaking with people um, since, since then, he was, um, and also from autopsy reports and the like, he had grown a beard, he had grown his long hair. The nails were long, very much in, a, in the same problem as uh, they found out with Howard Hughes, unkempt nails. Um, uh, neighbors, uh, there was a neighbor that walked in on him one day and he had become very frightened and suddenly scurried out of the barn. He was frightened to meet people. He was, he was terrified of meeting any new people. Uh, he, was, he was disappearing down, down, down into this little strange world of his that he had created. And the, the irony of this is this is a man that was promulgating and telling the world that with my technology and ideas you can get bigger and bigger and bigger and yet he was shrinking down until finally he was hiding and of course the, the Scientology had to put it that he was off researching when really the man was was hiding like Howard Hughes afraid of the world finding him what happened in the final couple of weeks of his life starting off with the gambling holiday um, in, in Reno for his doctor and Hubbard's stroke what, um, what I've been able to learn is that in the, the final weeks is that uh, Dr. Gene Denk uh, was with him up at the ranch for a very long time, taking care of him because Hubbard was very, um, uh, very concerned about his health. Um, he, he was always worried about colds and things like that. And um, finally, Denk and, and several others went up to uh, Reno, which is in the Lake Tahoe area of, of California, basically east of San Francisco, right on the border with Nevada. And I uh, went up there and gambled and spent some time. And that was when Hubbard had his, his last stroke. And Dink was, Dink was away, this is what I've been told. And um, Dink rushed back, and that was his final days. Was The irony was that his uh, physician was, was off gambling uh, when he had his final stroke. Do, was his is there any suggestion that his position had been taken away from his care? I don't know about that. Mm. And so when he's had his, his stroke, what physical and mental condition did that then leave Hubbard in? Hubbard, um, according, according to even what, what Dink was telling the, the coroner af afterwards, etc., was that Hubbard was severely incapacitated by the by the stroke as far as mental capacity um, he was able to ambulate he was able to walk about his speech was impaired uh, mental processes were going to mental processes were already going severely and so he was he was in very bad shape and the coroner at the time expressed that concern wondering whether or not he was uh, capable of understanding a last will capable of, of uh, understanding let alone signing uh, a last will, and that's that's still in question. What happened in that final week over the copyrights and the will, and what was Hubbard's, relate that to Hubbard's condition? So he's had his stroke. What then happened? There was there was a final a final transfer. There was a final movement of uh, and assignments, etc., that occurred. Um, and anybody that looks at the final will would say this is a um, uh, this is a very important legal document had Hubbard received proper legal advice. Well, Sherman Lansk was Hubbard's attorney. Sherman Lansk, 
I, I, I really dare him to say that he met with Hubbard. He never met with Hubbard. He has weaseled around this and made it appear that he met with Hubbard. There was nobody meeting with Hubbard. Hubbard was, uh, was alone. So he was being, if he signed that, then he was being given something to sign in a state while I will add on a psychiatric drug, Vistrol, being administered to him. And the entire future of Scientology and hundreds of millions of dollars in transfer of copyrights without legal advice? This, this is a serious question. Just to make it clear, who was with him when we, and, and, and who was getting him to do what, as it were, in that final week? Uh, best I can determine in the final week, the only people that were there with him were Pat and Annie Broker, uh, Gene Dink, and uh, there was a ranch hand, Steve Foff. Uh, I don't know if Steve was present in the room in those final days or saw him. But that was that was that was the entirety of it, from what I can determine. Oh, so Miscavige wasn't there. No. No, right. But but just so to make it clear, there were papers coming up for him to re-sign that were to do with the signing copyrights and then to do with changing his will. Can you just make it clear for us what it was that he was having to change in that final week? I I would have what, whatever Hubbard was signing in the final week or purportedly signing. Um, has to be taken not only in the context of his physical condition and who was present, but has to be taken in one of the context. Um, that material was being printed on a laser printer, a uh, computer printer. The ability to change this material was very easy to do. Also, Hubbard had signed blank sheets of paper that were to be used in his absence that we could then fill in as we wanted around it for an emergency. So there's a serious question that can be raised as to whatever he signed in the last weeks. Not only was he physically and mentally capable, but if he did sign it, was this the document that he actually signed or is this some other document? And what was the import of what he signed? What did, what did it change, the, 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 the documents that were signed that week? What did they actually change? Who ended up benefiting and who ended up losing? Who ended up benefiting was um, the organization called Religious Technology Center, which was then controlled by David Miscavige. And David Miscavige had control. So basically, Hubbard was turning it over all over to him without, in my estimation, being advised as to where it was going. He did not know how the organizations had changed below him and who was in control of them. He thought there was a former administrative guard there that he had put in place, and it was, had been completely gone. So he was turning it over to something that had been designed by David Miscavige. And that's, that's how it happened. And who lost? Family? Who lost was family. Um, the, the family, the children. And I might say since then the family has been rewritten or Orwellian style, just in uh, 1984 style. It's just been basically deleted from the records. They don't exist anymore. Uh, Mary Sue Hubbard is not referred to anymore. Uh, Suzette has is, is, is disappeared. Diana has disappeared. Quentin, is, of course, is dead. Arthur has disappeared. There's no more family. There's, there's no more family. Before, Hubbard had built it around a family uh, structure, but there is no more. So what happened on the day that Hubbard died? And why was it such a problem for Scientology that he died? Who was there? You know, what, what, what was happening? Well, first of all, you have to understand that... Um, in my opinion, Hubbard never believed he would die. He just, he just thought he could, he could beat it all the way. But um, him dying suddenly made him very mortal. And the last thing we could have is to have be, Hubbard be mortal. Uh, the last thing we could have is, a, is, is, is uh, the fact that he would just die of a stroke, if that's what he died of. Um, the worst, that would be the worst possible news, is that he had just died like everybody else did. He could not escape it. So a story had to be designed. And the story is that he went off to research the next level. And what's amazing is how the Scientologists bought this with, without any questioning. They, they bought it, um, that Hubbard was, had, had gone off. And he was not mortal, and there was hope. So basically, he was, he was just Jesus incarnate again that he had beaten death the way Jesus had beaten death, and so there's hope once again. Can you explain to me what actually happened on the day he died, you know, that the meeting was ending, and what, what was the problem? Um, 
the, it, the, the, the amazingly so the, the, the story of the, that, those f final few days and there was a three day delay between his death and the announcement um, is pretty well recorded except for some of the inside parts uh, in the coroner's report of this flurry of meetings as the attorneys came up and rushing into the coroner's office dashing back to Los Angeles bringing up the final wills etc and it became so apparent even to the coroner that they wanted to rush Hubbard's body through and get it out of there fast and get it cremated. And the main reason for that was is that nobody wanted any inspection. Nobody wanted anything to have any inspection of Hubbard's body and get it out of there, get it done, get it announced, get it away from the authorities. And that's what they were able to do. How did they actually announce the death to the church? What was actually said, you know, by Broken and Scavage? What was the story? How did they, you know, just about the shindig? Um, it was at the Hollywood Palladium, uh, quickly called. Everybody was ordered to, to come and attend. And uh, David Miscavige was the one that made the announcement in glorious terms about L. Ron Hubbard uh, has moved off to this next level of research. Um, the, one of the attorneys who came up to the ranch with me that, uh, that night when he died uh, also announced that everything was in final order. Pat Broker was at the ranch, he got up and said, you know, this is wonderful and confirmed it, because Pat Broker had been a, a very mysterious figure. And so if, if everybody there making this pronouncement about how he had, had taken off in this way, the Scientologists bought it. But then again, it's, it's, uh, it's not unusual. They had already bought Scientology, so why not buy the rest? What they were buying was that he hadn't died. He had decided to go off into the galaxy to do more... To, is that, this was... He'd, he'd voluntarily left his body. Is, that, is this the story? The, the impression that was being given was that he had voluntarily decided to leave and go off on his research. The difficulty with that is that, besides just the fact that it's not substantiated by anything in the physical universe, is that um, there was no announcement, there was no planning, there was no note of goodbye, although a couple of months later, there was a purported note that Miscavige later said was a forgery. So this, this became a very um, controversial period. But the main thing was that they had to present this man as just being in control of his life rather than life controlling him, because that's what he was selling to the world, was with my technology you can be in control of your life, including your death. And if he couldn't be in control of his death, then, he, then Scientology was a fraud. So to keep Scientology from being a fraud, he had to be in control right at the final moment. Has Broker, or has anyone told you anything else about that final week? Have we left anything out that's, in, that's important? No. Uh, what happened to the brokers? Um, I, I was uh, sent off, there was oh, about a year afterwards, after Harvard's death, the, um, there was a great shakeup and there was a purge um, uh, with the power play and shakeups and the brokers were removed from power. Annie Broker was sent off to one of the prison camps who, where I happened to be at the time. She arrived. She was completely broken. I, I, you know, Annie Broker just was a shell of a person. Uh, Pat Broker disappeared and uh, just went off and uh, nobody, nobody could find him. And the point was at that, at that moment, David Miscavige had finally taken final control of everything. He had taken over the Guardian's office which is the only section that could have ever prevented this thing from happening and convinced them that they were criminals and they needed to give up. He had taken over from Mary Sue and he had finally taken over from Pat Broker. All that was left at that point was David Miscavige. Okay, that's great on the death. Just a couple of questions on Operation Snow White. What was the purpose of Operation Snow White and what was achieved before it was uncovered? Snow White was purportedly designed by Harvard to find false reports in the files. Um, a deeper reason, a deeper truth was he was being denied access to certain countries. They were kicking him out. He was being kicked out of Greece and he had trouble in Portugal. And Hubbard, typical of his style, always believed it was somebody else's fault and never his fault. But the deeper truth was that he believed that there was an international cabal that was in control of the attack on him around the world as well as the attacks on various countries. And so Snow White was written in uh, 72, 73, to find this cabal, find all the connections between all these enemy groups, to expose them, to destroy them. And that's why he wrote Snow White. 
And in terms of the US, uh, what what did they actually manage to do? What were they? What, who were they infiltrating? What did they rewrite? What did they do that? One of the uh, requirements of the Snow White program was to go after government files, secret government files that mentioned Scientology, mentioned Hubbard. And in the United States, it just got a little bit out of control because it began to break into government offices and steal the files. Um, for that, we were raided. I was there during the raid of 1977 when the FBI came in and got all those files and got all the evidence of what had been going on. As a result, Mary Sue Hubbard, Hubbard's wife, and 10 other executives went to jail. And that was uh, that sent Hubbard off into hiding. And that really was, in effect, the, the, the final straw that sent him off into hiding and, and uh, took Mary Sue Hubbard out of control and finally brought David Miscavige into power. But just so that we got it clear for you, would the idea wasn't to steal, was it to that Scientologists would infiltrate, they'd work there, they'd find the record, they'd rewrite it, they'd, what, 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 what was the actual idea in terms of all those government departments and places that held records on them? Well, the main thing, the main, the main requirement was to get those files and to get the information. In some cases it was done through infiltration, in some cases it was done through burglary. Um, the idea was to get the information so you could learn the enemy's plans. It was, it was just pure military intelligence. If this were the CIA infiltrating, you know, the, the Russian government or even in the Italian government or even the British government, it would make sense. It just doesn't make sense for a, for a church to be doing this with the government. And you mentioned Mary Sue and uh, Lebanon's went to jail for it. Who was really behind Snow White? It was Snow White was Hubbard's program from day one. Uh, Mary Sue was assigned, executed, and there was this pyramid effect. Hubbard, Mary Sue, and then the inter international echelon, and then each of the continents, United States, UK, um, Europe, etc. And Hubbard was monitoring this whole thing at the top, and our reports went up to Hubbard. And uh, just, just, just by that much was he not indicted by the federal government in 1977 uh, or 78 when this was all all finished. I had heard that they had avoided it because it was not that evident. They were worried about getting the conviction of him and but he was in charge the the training that intelligence chiefs go through depends upon their hierarchy um, you're basically if you're an agent of course you're, you're trained to lie uh, they're, they're, you're trained to assume uh, identities uh, you're trained in document handling um, etc then as you move up you're, you're 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 trained in running agents double agents plants um, the one thing I, I always tell Scientology, um, the media, is that the one thing Scientology is very good at is intelligence. They're very good at running spies. In fact, it was after the raid of 1977 that one of the FBI chiefs said that Scientology had an intelligence apparatus that could, re you know, uh, be compared to what the Soviet Union had or the, or the Israelis. Not in size, but they're good. <laughs>